These mosquitoes were to be taken out to Australia and an operation called High Ball was to send 27 of them carrying the Barton's Wallace bouncing bomb. Not the same bomb as the Dam Busters because that had the shape of an oil drum, really, spinning oil drum. But the mosquito bouncing bomb was actually totally static. Um, and they were going to attack Japanese um, battleships which were in harbour. And they were worked up and ready to go. They just got the all clear to go when the atom bomb was dropped at Hiroshima and in Nagasaki and the war was over. So it never occurred. These were RAF boys, so don't ask me how they were going to get in this into use to the nonsense is a flicker I'm um, going up to, but there we are. Um, I suppose they were quite prepared to bust their planes as long as they could get back. Now, um, there were many other things that happened in the experimental shop. And let's go to another very important one. And that was that when Wallace actually invented the um, Moyna Dam bomb, the bowl job, I was very much involved in that. And I did, um, I made, again, an automatic flight observer. We had, um, if I remember, two Wellingtons, actually, which were employed on uh, the drops that were made. And... Um, the, uh, it was really quite a challenge then because uh, I was involved in the uh, Wellingtons themselves. And there's a story to tell. I mean, there are many stories about Wallace and his absolutely inhuman attitude uh, towards people. And I don't know whether you had actually met any of these. But Wallace was an absolute terror. Though he was a um, uh, a man of very high principle, and um, he was a vegetarian and so on and so forth. Uh, he certainly made bombs and things, but what I wouldn't forgive him for is his absolute inhumanity. And um, I ran into this. Yes, I, I went to the experimental department, but I did get mixed up with the last part of the Tall Boy and Grand Slam situation where we, we made bits and pieces to convert the uh, Lancasters, which were converted and done up at Woodall Spa and some of the other satellite airfields around um, Lincoln. And then there was a development of the uh, Myrna and Ida Dam, or bouncing bomb of Barnes Wallace. There was a development of that which was never used, and I believe I'm right in saying it is still on sort of either restricted or secret list. It was a, that brought um, to light this peculiar friendship and, and thoughtfulness of people like Sir George Edwards because during the development of this we had to spin the um, air turbine up to test it. The air turbine was used to spin the balls and we had to test this air turbine. First one we tested, it disintegrated and went through the roof of the hangar. 
and we phoned up about midnight one night to, as he was then, Mr. Edwards, now Sir George Edwards, and told him what had happened. And the, his first words were, Are you blokes all right? And that was the, the measure of this sort of family and friendship uh, that you always got from the from the management. He didn't worry about the job. His first thoughts were, are all the chaps all right? And it, it, it was a marvellous illustration of the attitude which has pertained all through the years. There was another funny incident that I hadn't mentioned, or two actually. I did mention the mosquitoes related to the Wallace's ball job. And we had a whole whole fleet of mosquitoes at Weybridge, and we converted the whole of them to carry the the rotating ball jet bomb. These converted mosquitoes, I mean, they were only converted for test drops, weren't they? Um, the no, there must have been a mosquito squadron. We oh, did with, with, with balls in them? Yeah, yeah. Really? To do that, to do the same raid? Or what? Well, not to do the same raid, but obviously to do other objectives. Right. I never really knew what the whole of the plan was, but I, I, I actually installed the wiring and everything in the, um, in the whole of them. And they were all over on the track shed, shed side. And um, we had several sort of things happen about those. Um, the most, the, the worst, of course, was that the, the mosquito was notorious for actually swerving on takeoff. And uh, we had uh, two aeroplanes uh, swerve on take off simultaneously, which couldn't be more balmy on a narrow runway. And um, they, one of them swerved, and it hit a lorry actually on the perimeter track. The wing went right through the whole of the cab, and the girl mate in that was badly hurt. She was hit on the head, and the poor old driver was trapped by his foot. And I always remember racing round. Uh, the track actually on the motorcycle, dashing inside the aeroplane to disconnect the batteries, which was probably a pretty dangerous thing to do, but you don't think of these things uh, when you get a problem. Well, we had that, and then um, there was a chap called Wing Commander Hutchinson, who was the CO of the RAF um, camp at Turnbury in Scotland. And they were going up there, actually, and for some reason or other, Sir George asked me, well, he was George then, to go up there because there was some sort of problem and take some test gear up. So I went to work every day with a bag ready to go on with old Hutch on this aeroplane, and it was delayed. And on the Friday, I came in with my bag, and the old man, as he usually is quite sort of rough about these things, OK, you don't need the bloody well go. He said, I'll, I'm going on that, so I'll go on the aeroplane tomorrow when it takes off. So he got... He he was just going to get on the aeroplane, and um, he suddenly realised he's like, he forgot his raincoat. So he said, "Eric, get my car, go around and get my I mean, uh, raincoat out of Jimmy Green's office. I left it in there." So he didn't go on that, and there was to be another aeroplane to follow. So he decided to go on the second one. Well, Hatch took off. Fortunately, George wasn't in it, but anyway, he took off, and he veered off the runway, and his wing hit. Just below where I was standing, there was a lorry coming up the perimeter track, and his wing hit the top of the of the cab of the lorry. And the poor old lorry driver, he wasn't hit, but he was so petrified that he went, he completely passed out. He fell out on the ground, and I picked him up and laid him on the grass. And, of course, the horrifying thing was that the, uh, the one of the engines came off the mosquito, and there was um, a Bloom Barrage group had a hut there with where their cable was, and one of the engines flew right up onto the actual steps and landed right outside the thing. Um, and the next, and I crossed it, and then the aeroplane finished in a power of flame. Where the balls went, we didn't at that time know, but they went right over the sewage farm over the other side. But we thought there was uh, old Hutchinson and his flight sergeant on that aeroplane. And all of a sudden, I saw them walking down the perimeter track. And then one of them was bleeding from his face and so on and so forth. 
And it was absolutely fantastic how they never got out of that thing. And I was talking to his flight sergeant afterwards. When they hit the, the, the lorry, it sheared the whole of the bottom hatch off, which you've got at the bottom of Wellington, and they both fell out onto the road. And he told me that that was the 27th accident that he'd been in with Hutch. And he said, I wouldn't fly with anybody else. He said, we've gone out from, we've actually been to the bottom of the channel and swum up. And he said, I've never been in one, actually, in which we didn't get out. Job known as Eyeball, based on the bouncing bomb principle, but refined to be used by Mosquito aircraft against the Japanese Navy. You may recall that the American Navy chased the Japanese Navy all round the Pacific for about 18 months and never caught up with them. <laughs> and um, they hit upon this idea and it got as far as a squadron of mosquitoes being mustered for this special job which was sort of a one-way ticket job because they could take off from the carriers, but they couldn't land back on them. Um, and it was all sort of set up to go off. And the I understand that the Americans vetoed it and um, we, we they were never used. There's a lot of trial and error in that operation, wasn't there? Oh, yes, because nobody had ever done anything like it before. I mean, we, we, used, the, we used the water tanks at the NPL and all that jazz, but that was a hell of a long way away from doing it with a lank. You... Uh... You brought your, some of your cricketing experience as a bowler, leg spin bowler. Oh, in, the early, in the early days of the thing, I was doing the experimental trials on the thing, and uh, Wallace and others were of the opinion that the, the, the bomb needed top spin on it. I was quite sure that it didn't, and uh, that it needed back spin because. As a bit of a bowler, I, I I knew near enough the difference between topspin and backspin, especially as far as water went. I had some difficulty in convincing the powers that be that that was the way of it. And I finally convinced them by getting a catapult built with an arrangement so that I could fire, I could fire one with a bit of backspin on and fire another one with no spin at all and then fire another one with, with a with a top spin. And to everybody else's surprise, the one with top spin screwed itself in, the one with no spin hardly bounced at all and the one with backspin skittled along the lake like about ten, 10 or a dozen times. That was at NPL. No, that was at a that was at a lake uh, in Cobham. You went around looking for lakes, didn't you? To try well, to... I knew about this one because I was running an experimental shop on on the edge of it. So I went and saw a lady who owned it and said I wanted to borrow her lake, and I had to explain that it was part of the operation for defeating Hitler. And she said, well, in that case, my boy, you take the lake and do anything you like with it, if that's what it is. So off I went with a lady's blessing. An aerodrome there, which is, I, I'm sad to say that I've forgotten the name of, that's your old age. Well, now... <laughs> that aerodrome's Hornchurch, by the yes, way. Yes. I flew down in the in a, in a mosquito. We had some mosquitoes that we were converting for the boil job. And I flew down in the mosquito. 
which is quite an experience actually, since I was always air sick. And um, <laughs> we got down there, and we had the Wellington down there. Um, it was quite an exciting time, and um, we. What actually happened was we were put up in the officers' mess, and I was put up there actually with a number of the other members of. Um, there were some drawing office people as well as myself. Anyway, one day actually, uh, I'd been on the aerodrome was, uh, and watching the aeroplane while it was doing its stuff and making sure everything was okay. And I got back in the evening and went to walk up the steps of this place. There was a chap named Flight Lieutenant Green, was a well, liaison officer with the ministry. And he said to me, stop, you can't come in here. So I said, what do you mean you can't come in here? My, my bags are in here. I said, I was just, just finished and so on. He said, you can't come out of here. He said, uh, you're not staff. But I said, I'm shop super. He said, oh, no. He said, can't come in here. So it turned out that Wallace had told, told the authorities that we were not senior staff of the company. And... Um, They'd promptly actually thrown us out. And I said, well, you know, where are you going to put us? So they said, oh, you've got to go down to uh, one of the huts. And when I went down to this hut that they told me about, it was a Marine's hut, and it was a big dormitory. And I said, I'm not going to sleep in here. Um, no way. I went down. It was late in the afternoon, and I went down to the aeroplane. I thought, I'll sleep on the aeroplane. I'll go back in the next day and tell old George Edwards what I think about Wallace. I went down to the aerodrome, to the aeroplane rather, and of course the aeroplane was under guard, and the the, uh, the police were there actually, uh, the MPs and all that, and uh, they said, "Look, you know, we know that you're you're, you're cleared for the aircraft. It would be more than our job is worth to let you sleep on it. Come and sleep in our hut. We'll look after you, and so on." Which they did. I had great big mugs of tea and great big bacon sandwiches in the morning. Um, not bad for a Jewish lad, actually, really, <laughs> and. Um, Next morning, I started to march off towards the station, carrying all my, well, I had my test gear with me. And um, I met Matt Summers. And Matt said, where are you going? And I said, I'm going back to Weybridge. I was in Pakistan down here, actually. I well, had just had a thrown out of the officer's uh, quarters and so on. But I was all concerned, I'm going back. I didn't get somebody else. So uh, he said, he said, go back to the aeroplane. He said, I'll get your car. And he was as good as his word. It was very exciting down at this place because there were bombings all day long and uh, machine guns and Gordon as well going. It really was very exciting. Now, Wallace is the entourage who had managed to stay in the officer's mess. When I had a car, and they didn't have a car, you see, they did everything they possibly could to persuade me to let them have the key of my car. And no way. What I did, I collected all the boys who got thrown out. Some I found had slept in the first aid department. They'd slept in all sorts of holes and corners, and they'd left them. And we went out towards Westgate, and we stopped at a place which was had been a hotel in peace, and they put us up and lived like kings in this place. And I hung on to that car until we went back to Weybridge again. And uh, so Wallace didn't quite win on that one. Well, doing these tests, like I said, on, on, on a lake, but then build, building the first set, set of parts and putting them in an aeroplane and putting a dummy bomb in to see if it worked, that, that, as far as the dam busters were concerned, that kept, uh, that, that kept us pretty quiet. We didn't have much time to go swanning around visit, visiting RAS stations because what we're being asked to do was really right outside the the, the, the run of, of, of a normal aircraft factor. The, and, of course, there was, there was the other one in which we put smaller bombs into mosquitoes. This thing called, code name was... Highball, and that was originally it for both well, dams. It was used. It, it 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 was intended to sink the Japanese fleet, uh, and and it was a boy. It was a pretty lethal. But it was a pretty lethal bit of equipment. We used to do test flying up and down. 
the Scottish mountains, we had a French battleship moored in Locks Riven. And I must say, tearing down the side of those mountains in a mosquito with some uh, very, uh, very aggressive and highly excitable young fighter pilot uh, with his head down, ready to put a, a large ball straight through the sides of battle one of the battleship and coming out the other side. That 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 was what I would describe as an interesting experience doing that. The next thing that really happened was that, um, and I had to put uh, some flash bulbs in the front gun turret of the Wellington, which were coincident with the dropping of the bomb, so that the kili cameras could pick up the actual flash, which would give you the and uh, the start of the bomb uh, release from the aeroplane, so they could actually look at the mm. the characteristics of the drop. And uh, George Edwards got hold of me and he said, "Look, actually, I've had a problem down that turret." Uh, at Weymouth, one of the bombs had fallen off in the middle of the town. And of course, they were um, they weighed a half a ton, but fortunately, didn't have any sort of explosive in them. But they were they were weighted. But a half a ton ball falling from an aeroplane, uh, which was being spun incident, caused absolute consternation. The old man said, "Get all your gear, actually, and got an aeroplane flying in to pick you up first thing in the morning." That was first thing on the Saturday morning. Well, Wallace saw Wallace, and he said. You find out what the hell's gone wrong with it, I mean, saying, actually. And they said the bomb didn't fall out in the town. It fell out in the cliffs. It just bounced off the cliff into the sea, which was a jolly good thing. I'm pleased about that. Um, and so I went over this system. And I went over it on the basis of probabilities uh, because it, there was no obvious fault with it. And when I had to look at back feeds and any possible um, sort of... Um, what should we say, a sequence of events that could have, in actual fact, caused a drop of this particular kind. And there was there was just no sense to it. It just didn't make sense. There wasn't obviously any reason on God's earth. The system was perfectly okay, and there was nothing it could find wrong with it. So, um, Wally said to me, um, you're already competent. Go back and tell George Edwards to sack you. So uh, off I went. Um, bent back and I was in very high touch and I remember I saw the old man and I saw a bloody Wallace and all that and I, I mean cheek and so on there's nothing wrong with the damned aeroplane I don't know there's some there's some reason for all of this so I said you know he's, I'm supposed to be sacked so uh, and George said you know, forget about that I'll go and see him and so on and so forth so I never heard any more about it for two or three weeks I suppose and then there was a chap named Purse Mew that used to do all the photography and he turned up about, well, it must have been a fortnight or three weeks later, mm -hmm. and he said, by the way, you know your automatic auto observer you put in the aeroplane? He said, that's got marvellous pictures on it. So I said, oh, that's good, actually. Have you got them? And he said, yes. And it suddenly dawned me. I said, how many drops did it show? And he said it showed four drops. But I said, actually, that there were three official drops and one fell out. Let's have a look at the pictures. We looked at the pictures, the RPM and everything else, was absolutely spot on for a drop. But furthermore, the only way that opera, that uh, recorder operated was I actually took the bomb push that they had in the in the cockpit and I made a new one by hand, which had an extra contact in it, so that when you press the bomb push, it started the auto recorder going. So there wasn't any doubt that what had happened was that um, that one of them pressed the bomb, the bomb push. So. I took this to George Edwards and I said, look, I'd like to go and see Wallace and just put this up, stick this right up his nose because there's no doubt about it, one of the crew actually released the blooming bomb. So he said, oh, yeah, fine, actually, don't worry about it, I'll do it. So he went off to see Wallace, actually, and I didn't see Wallace for a little while, but ever after I saw Wallace, Wallace used to say, how is the king of electrics today? I was his absolutely pet boy. I couldn't do anything wrong as far as Wallace was concerned right. because he jolly well been caught out uh, with his rudeness and so on. But he really was very, very, very inhuman. Now, I'm not the only person who's experienced these things, and there are many, many stories like it. So um, 
there it is. But I'm always amused about it, Tom Wallace. I mean, I do admire the tremendously quick mind that he had. Uh, he was brilliant for his, I mean, when he was 80, he was as clear as a bell. Um, and I got to know him on much more friendlier terms later on. Of course, after that that, uh, that little sort of incident, I, I never really had any bad words with him at all. And I was always very welcomed over in what we call the Witch's Cave, which is now the museum. And uh, it, it was subsequently, the operation was subsequently stopped when we got it all ready to go because I, I don't know where the decision was taken, but the decision was taken somewhere and there was a feeling that it was in America that this was going to give the Japanese Navy a weapon that... Uh, would 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 be counterproductive as far as the American fleet was concerned. They'd be so vulnerable with uh, the, the the large Japanese naval air force. Um, they 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 reckon. That. Well, the whole gear was set up for an attack on Japan, and it was cancelled, so that they didn't get. Um, so that they didn't get enough of it to be able to copy it and put it on, put it on the uh, American suitable aeroplanes. <laughs> 